Welcome to the Boat Buyer Secret Weapon Series. I am your host, Captain Matt, and today we're talking Cobalt Boats. And the question, are they the best bow rider, family bow rider with the stern drive for the lakes out there? Are they the best? Um, you'd say a lot of people would say, yeah, they absolutely are. So let's dive in and take a look at the Cobalt Boat history uh, how they build their boats and and what uh, what I think of them. So we'll start with uh, they were started in their start, <laughs> lots of starts there. Founded in 1968 by Pack Saint Clair in Nadosha, Neodesha, Kansas. Um, I knew how to say that when I first was going to record this video, uh, but they've been there since the early early days. They focused on quality and service and building a great dealer network. They built the tri halls in the seventies. Uh, in 2015, they tried to enter the pontoon market with the marker one pontoon. It had a 10 foot beam, which I think was the downfall at that time. I, I don't think that was the right fit. People were going to have to reconfigure their docks. Um, and, and it just, it, it wasn't going to do the trick in 2017, uh, Brunswick, lost their lawsuit cobalt one about their patented swim step the flip down swim step that flips down from the um uh, the swim platform they won that suit brunswick tried to incorporate it into their models and their their patent suit won. they were sold to malibu boats in 2017 for 130 million dollar valuation now they kept Everything in Kansas, the manufacturing in Kansas, they kept the management team on. Uh, they didn't make any changes right away. Uh, Pax, Pax Sun St. Clair, uh, the son, uh, he stayed on the board of directors. He was really, the at the time, leading the company. Uh, his father uh, had stepped away, was still involved a little bit, but had really stepped away from the day-to-day. -day. Um, and, and I believe Pax and Sons, I think there's three of them, that are that are involved um, in the later years of the company, but Pac Sun stayed involved in the company at the at the board of directors level, and uh, all the other management team stayed on. Now in 2021, so four years after the um, after the acquisition from Malibu, um, I, I saw the first boat design that I'm like, hmm, interesting. The new R8. Um, it has, I think Malibu influences. So if you just look at it, the, the bow is a little bit more compressed and a little stubbier. The cleats are, are squared off and they're, they're not the sleek, classy lines that I expect from Cobalt and Cobalt has always been one of my favorite boats, even, even as a kid, before I really knew much about how boats were built. It just was a head turner. And um, this is the first time I've seen some design changes that I'm like, oh, okay, maybe Malibu's getting their uh, fingers in the uh, in the planning stages a little bit. But this is the early boats. This was a, a 1968 boat, their tri-haul uh, and their V-haul, which at the time, V-hauls were closed bows. And I think that was uh, maybe a construction issue. But over time, they started going from the tri hauls to the V hauls. And, and as soon as they did that, they got that deep V with the sharp pointy nose that if, in my opinion is, has made cobalt. Um, I mean, it's just, you see that the lines of the cobalt and you know, and, and a big part of it is that sharp pointy nose that they have. So these are the, the models that, uh, as they've gone and kind of, as you have gone through, the years with cobalt you can see uh bow riders they did some bigger bow riders and cruisers um they did this little speedboat kind of looking style in the the mid to late 80s um and, and then when they get to 88 i saw this boat and um it just if you took those graphics off which were clearly late 80s graphics with the flags on it the nautical flags um you got the sense that that could easily be a, a current day boat. As you get into the nineties, um, again, those, what you kind of think of as cobalt lines really, really started to appear. 
as you got into the 2000s, you saw some of the bigger cruisers, some of the bigger bow riders that they were getting into, but still that sharp V, the deep, deep holes um, is what you're looking at. And then as we get into today, uh, you know, the, the looks haven't changed dramatically until you get to 2022. And then you start seeing, you can kind of see that back end squared off. You can see that square cleat there. It doesn't show as good in this picture, but the one I saw um, on the water, it was up on a lift and it just looked, the bow looked stubby. Like they moved everything forward to have less bow, get some weight move forward maybe, and to have more cockpit behind the windshield. And it just, it looked different. Uh, is what I'll say, but still a good sharp looking boat, but you just got the sense that maybe somebody else was having a little bit of influence on them. So the models, you've got the R series, uh, which are, are their top end from 26 about to 35 about the A series, which are their bigger bow riders, um, which and cruisers, the A29, A36, A36 BR, which is the um, has the the bow rider um, kind of setup, and then the S, the 220S, the CS22, and the CS23 are they're the luxury models, which is what Cobalt has has built over the years. They're the luxury models, but they're scaled back a little bit. So they're still clearly cobalt, still built to the same specs, but they're just, they're not as deep. They do a few little things um, to get that price point down to, to compete more on price with the Sea Rays, the Regals, the Chaparrells uh, in, in those category and um, versus the, the R Series and the A Series, which I think are, are just stand head and shoulders above. Um, when it comes to that luxury and the class, I think classy is a, a great way to describe the cobalts. And then you get the surf series, um, and then you get their outboard series, which they've recently re they've recently introduced, uh, and the R series in an outboard, which is basically they've just configured it uh, to put hang the outboards on the back of it instead of using the stern drive. It opens up some storage in the boat as they all do, and um, and, and that's their current lineup for 2022. So. I, I thought this was interesting. I did this on Sea Ray uh, and, and kind of went through the progression of the models that they built through the years and the number. So uh, how many how many Cobalts do you think that they built in 2019? And I use 2019 because 2020 numbers are available. I'll show those to you. Put it in the comment what you think. See if you can guess this. But um, in 2020, we had the shutdown for 45 days or so, so their number was a little bit less in 2020 of, of boats built. All sizes, all models, just over 2,400 boats. So I thought that was it was bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, I didn't think they built nearly that. I would have put that number around just over 1,000 or so is what was in my head, but... Um, 2,400 is a, a good number of boats at the price points that they're selling and the level of quality that they've continued to maintain um, even after Malibu has, has taken them over and they've been able to keep to their roots, except, like I said, the 2022 model, starting to see some influence. I didn't get a chance to go through it and, and look at the build quality to see what I saw there, but $140 million in revenue. The average wholesale boat price is about 90000 so what the dealers are buying them for, and, and they've got about a 17 to 18, 18% EBITDA margin, uh, which is the earnings before taxes, depreciation, interest, and amortization, um, and about 132 dealers worldwide. I, I don't know how accurate that number is. I think it might have been a little bit old, but um, that's all taken from the 2020 Malibu annual report. Malibu is a public company, so those numbers are out there. Now, in 2020, they actually built uh, just 1,956 boats uh, at at 174 million in uh, revenue. So, um, you know, a little bit higher revenue, a little bit lower 
dollar amount. And again, that's directly from the annual pro. But as I was doing the research, I, I researched all the way back to 1972 brochures. So if you want to check those brochures out, if you're interested, and we'll go through the build process here in just a little bit. But uh, these are the links you can you can uh, type those in and you can go look at the year model that you're interested in. Some models, they use this format, uh, the year underscore cobalt underscore boats and in some of the models usually the later ones it was cobalt underscore year so if you want to check that out if you're looking to buy a boat check out the first time boat buyers academy boatbuyersecretweapon.com slash academy and you'll get some great information there it's an incredible program um so in 1990, they showed kind of their their lamination schedule is what it called the way they build their boats from the gel coat layer, the thicknesses to their skin coat with their chop gun, the mat, the woven roving, the mat, the woven roving, uh, the mat, the woven roving. Um, that's the lamination schedule. And then they put the resin on each of those layers, roll out the bubbles. And that's how you get a nice thick hole structure a nice solid hole is by by having that lamination schedule is what gets you there the cheaper brands the less expensive boats have either not as thick a material so they're not using 24 ounce woven roving um 1.5 ounce mat and then the 24 ounce they'll use a little bit less and the the resin um they're using a different combination of thickness to the amount of resin that they lay and the uh, the skin coat with that chop gun. Now, in 2000, uh, I think this was like 15 or 16, they showed another one where they started putting the Kevlar in. Or no, I'm sorry, this was 2005, uh, around that. Uh, they started laying a Kevlar layer down the keel. Now, Kevlar is what they use to make the bulletproof vest from. That Kevlar layer is laid just on that keel where you're most likely to strike something. That It's partly marketing, um, partly, hey, it's a really strong material when you glass it in, and, um, and it's going to give you a really solid um, point where you're most likely to strike an underwater obstruction, a rock or a log, uh, run into ground. And, uh, again, they put their lamination schedule right out there so you can see it. And like all builders, their lamination schedule will overlap at the V. So if you can imagine the V, they lay it down one side and then up the other side a little bit so that that keel layer, it has the double thickness because it's, it's getting both sides of the uh, of the lamination schedule and it, it doubles that thickness. So that's part of what they do incredibly well is their lamination schedule but there's also some other things that i wanted to point out and that is their reverse chine which right here the chine line is where the v goes to the whole side so that's the chine line and a reverse chine is one that goes down and then up um, that is a reverse chine so that chine and these lifting strakes if you can see these big like stair step and looking things um, what that does is two things. One is in a turn, you've got those, um, you've got those lifting strakes are going to bite into the water and you've got that reverse chine line biting into the water on the banking side. That's going deeper into the water, get you a nice, solid, comfortable, stable turn. Um, that chine line also splashes the water down, um, so that it's, it don't have as wet of a ride. The other thing that those big, huge lifting strakes do, and just like Sea Ray does this, uh, the better manufacturers will have a thicker, heavier duty lifting strake, which is difficult to build. If you know how they lay the the molds, if you watch my um, my bow rider video, you can see I, I talk about and show the mold, but they've got to get that gel coat down into that crevice, perfectly level, perfectly. Um, the the same thickness and then they've got to lay their first layer of chop uh their their vinyl ester resin layer and then their woven roving uh, and their mat and their kevlar and they've got to get that all to go down into that uh that chine which on the mold on the inside is like trying to get it squeezed into a little crack and crevice makes it really hard to do um but the result is when that boat gets going, 
those lifting strakes kick in and get up on top of the water more and give you a more smooth, comfortable, more efficient ride because you're not running through the chop. You actually get up on top of the water and you can feel it when you're on plane. And it does uh, an incredible job. So that's the that's one. The next thing that they do that is just they've always done it is a, a classy helm. It w- doesn't matter what year you look at, it looks beautiful. Whether it's the colors, the uh, the stitching that they use is it, just it, cobalt signature. Um, the gauges, just the whole layout of the helm, the armrest for the uh, throttle. Uh, the, everything, the steering wheel, everything they do is just classy, looks great. And, and um, the stainless steel, they, they use the highest quality 316th stainless steel to avoid that uh, rust and corrosion. Uh, they put a stainless steel uh, plate on so that if your anchor comes up, it doesn't scratch. When you're putting it on the trailer, it doesn't scratch. Uh, they've got the big, always big, huge, heavy-duty hardware, whether it's these uh, Z hinges um, that have the, the full-length hinge, uh, nice heavy-duty screws. Look at the thickness of that. Um, their flooring, they use this honeycomb composite where the honeycomb is in between a layer of uh, fiberglass honeycomb and then another layer of fiberglass it gets the lightness because of the honeycomb but you get the strength and rigidity by putting those two materials together into a composite and that's what they're using for the for the deck or the sole of the um of the boat again the kevlar which they use and these um these really easy to use kind of hanging clips for the fenders now on one hand they're awesome they're huge they're chunky they're stainless steel they got the cobalt logo on them they're super easy to use you plug them in you push it in and you pull it back out uh, the little plunger and they're super easy to use on the bad side i hate them (laughs) i hate them because if the fenders aren't if the fender clips where you put them in there's only two on each side if they don't match up with where you're tying up then you're you got to get out different fenders with an actual rope on uh, because otherwise you've got this big huge heavy stainless steel clip that's going to be scratching up your boat so if everything matches up and everything's perfect they're awesome if you tie up at a dock where things don't match up you're tying up with another boat that's a little different size uh, you're hitting a, a weird spot well guess what now they they're terrible they're the worst because they're going to scratch up your boat you have to get rid of them and get out fenders that just have regular lines on them. The swim step, again, it's another one of those things that's it's awesome. I love it. Um, the uh, R5 that I'm fortunate to boat on that my in-laws have uh, in Tennessee has, it's a, has the swim step. It's a 2019, I think, um, 2018, 2019. And it is, it's got the Volvo and it's got the swim step. The swim step is awesome. My kids love it. They can sit on it in the water. They can jump off it. It's super, super heavy duty. The hardware is awesome. It is thick. It is sturdy. Um, On the negative side is it's a big step up from that swim platform onto the swim deck. So for my my mother-in-law, who is 70s, um, that's a huge step for her to get up. And she's in good shape. She's active. She's healthy. Um, but it's a hard step up. I've got some bad knees and, uh, you know, it's, it's a big step up for me and, um, I'm, I'm younger and pretty mobile. Um, so that part is, is disappointing. There's no other ladder. If you go with that option, the other part is to put it up. You've got to pull out this little plunger right here, which is the release big, heavy duty stainless. It's not going to, it's not going to have any problems but you've got to reach down to pull it up and then get that big old ladder um, to flip all the way up. And it's a, you know, it's not impossible to do, uh, but it's a, it's a chore. Not, and any ladder that you're going to put up and down on a bow rider on the swim platform is going to be challenging. This is just, it's, it's challenging. It, it's a little bit more challenging, I think, than, than a ladder that's got some sort of strap on it or, um, and to, to get it on and off. They've also got their extended running surface, which they introduced back in the early 
2000s, maybe even in the 90s, um, where they're actually setting the stern drive, that lower unit, uh, mounting it on the transom, but then they're extending the running surface back to um, to allow the boat to plane out better. That's what the marketing says, anyway. Um, yeah, it, so it's it, instead of it gives you more. It kind of works like trim tabs almost, where it gives you that additional running surface, so you don't bow up as much. They're they're not adjustable, obviously, but that's a, another marketing piece. Because Cobalt has the reputation, uh, I, I'm going to believe that it, it makes a difference. I know um, uh, Chaparral does something similar, and you see a few other brands do similar things. The upholstery. This is something that is is amazing. They have got awesome, thick, heavy-duty upholstery. It's got a texture to it, um, which is, is fantastic. It, it's just thick and the stitching's beautiful um the like the little uh pattern is is just gorgeous on the other hand because they go for class because they're they're building this for a more upscale a little bit older crowd because of the price point um not always but traditionally a little bit older um things are a little tougher to clean because of all the texture. They've got texture surface on all this beautiful um, browns and the the good look of that helm, that classy look of the helm that I was talking about. On the flip side, if you get a little sunscreen on there, um, it gets down to the cracks and the crevices, and it's really hard to clean. Um, and my, my in-laws, they like to keep their boat looking great. And um, I've got a 7 and a 10-year-old that have to get lubed up with sunscreen and you know, they don't always wash their hands before they get in the boat and start touching every surface around. Um, so when I clean the boat, hey, it's it, it's a challenge to get all of that off. Um, but because it's good quality material, you know, you can scrub on it a little bit uh, without causing any problems. Uh, but that's one of the negatives. Now, this is probably my biggest gripe with it. Um, they've got their head compartment. And this is the R5 picture. And you can see... They've got a really small lip on here, so you don't have a big step down. They've got a little stepping surface. You can step into it, step down, and you can use the head. Now, with that comes a very, very low door that swings out. You have to on the R5. You've got to flip up the bolster so you can get it. You can get it opened and closed all the way, uh, which is okay. It's a, it's a tighter space. That's how they have to do it to have a, a bigger door to make it an easy entrance. But that is a huge toe stubber. I I can't believe that Cobalt hasn't done something to at least raise it up another inch or two. Um, even if that makes this lip have to be just a little bit bigger, because the reality is we all know that this head compartment doesn't get used all that often um, on, on 90% of the boats. It just doesn't get used. Uh, but that's why they've got that low lip. So it's easier to step into. I would love to see them make some sort of adjustment to it so that, um, so that toes don't get stubbed when that, uh, when that door open and closes. Now that's on the R5. I believe the R7 is the same and the R6 and the R8, I believe are the same, um, although I, I haven't had my toe stubbed by it like I have on the R5. So um, that is is one of the things I don't like. A couple of the things that I'm disappointed in is these red circles. Um, the, the boat's kept on a lift, so we're pulling into a U-shaped slip, and the because of the way the swim platform is designed, it's set in probably six inches from the the outside of the hull. It's it's narrower, so it's a long step on a. It's only probably a uh, maybe a ten foot slip, ten foot wide slip. So what is that? Six, eight, ten inches on each side. Um, it is a long step from that swim platform onto the dock. So that doesn't really work for my kids and for my in-laws. Um, but there's no textured surface on this hull side. So if you are stepping from the boat onto the dock, there, there's no textured surface area to step. Now it looks great. It's smooth, nice, clean fiberglass. Um, but it's as fiberglass is, it's slick. Uh, so that's kind of disappointing that they haven't done that. You've got to step from inside the boat on the seat 
onto the dock and it's a really, really long step versus if there was some texture there, you could more safely step from there uh, onto the dock. The next thing is the cooler. So the cooler is a built-in cooler. Uh, you flip up this seat and it's got a drain in it uh, and it's supposed to be the cooler. Now, if you're to bang on this, there's some styrofoam in there, but it's not foamed enough to keep your ice and your drinks cold. Um, it, it's just, it's not in my mind, a functional cooler. Um, and you know, you leave something in there, it gets wet, it gets smelly. It, it's just in my mind, it's, it's not the best way to do it. They could either foam it in better and make the drainage system really, really better. Um, or they could do something else and make a different cooler storage there. Because what happens is when we use the boat, we bring our own cooler on, which sits right here because otherwise you block the walkway from the, the transom walkthrough in it sits here. And now you've got a leg rest for this person, but here's what happens with that is now because of the seating layout, you have most of your weight on the port side. Okay. So you've taken all the weight that would have been in the cooler here because the cooler doesn't work very well as a cooler. You've got your weight of your cooler here. The next best seat in the house, according to my wife, is this seat right here. This backrest flip-flops back, so you have a forward-facing. You, you can lay your legs out. The next best seat is right here next to them with your legs up on the cooler. And the next best seat is right here behind the windshield. Uh, this backrest flip-flops, and now you've got a, a forward-facing seat there with a the bolster. So you consider you can stand. And then the next best seat is... Up, up in front of the windshield where my kids like to be on the port side so that if they're taller, they're not blocking the driver. So now you've got the captain sitting here and you've got weight, weight, cooler weight, weight, weight. And, and now the boat lists a little bit uh, when you're cruising. And that list is to port side. Um, the R five doesn't have trim tabs. I'm not sure if it's an option, but it's a 25, 26 foot boat. It shouldn't need trim tabs. Um, and it's, it's something that I was really surprised. Now moving that cooler weight over would probably make a difference. What I have to do is I have my girl sit on either center in the bow or in the right side. And, um, you know, that it, if I've got an adult in the front, I'll have the adult sit on the starboard side. Um, and you know, it's, it's deep enough. So they don't really block my, my line of sight. And I usually stand up when I drive the boat. Um, uh, but it's something that, um, you know, for everything else that cobalt does incredibly well, it, it's one of those things that, man, I, I'm, I'm surprised their 26 foot, 25, 26 foot boat lists a little bit. So those are the things that, um, you know, kind of nitpicking, you, you really got to go, deep on the cobalt to find things that you're like, you know, they could do better here. And, um, but over the years, cobalt boat after boat after boat has been, has been rock solid. They've also got their, a, a good warranty. Um, the, uh, 10 year structural warranty, hull decks, fully transferable five year bow to stern warranty, everything canvas upholstery, fully transferable, uh, the gel coat warranty, uh, three years on the gel coat, getting the gel coat to look as good as they do is a difficult process. There is a lot of prep work to that mold, waxing, rewaxing, rewaxing. I think they, they said in one of the videos I watch, they wax that mold like seven or eight times the first time they use it. And then they wax it after every, I, I don't know what, it, I think it was like five, every five holes that they do, they'll rewax it. Um, and that allows that gel coat to lay perfectly smooth and when they pop it out it just slips out and you've got a perfect reflective smooth smooth gel coat you'll see on some of the uh, cheaper manufacturers they don't take that time to wax the molds to use the same level of care the same uh, quality of gel coat and, and when they pop it out you'll see some blemishes you'll see some little things that just doesn't have that shine that you get with the um with the cobalt gel coat now with that said you pay for it you, you pay for the quality, the reputation, the brand recognition, uh, you, you pay for the brand 
but you get the quality. It always drives me ca- crazy when people say, "Yeah, you pay for the you pay for the name." Well, you pay for the name because the name has earned it year after year, decade after decade with quality boats, um, with quality builds and standing behind it. And it, I, I think Cobalt does it um, fantastic. So these are a, a build sheet of the CS22. Like I said, it's a, a little bit scaled down version. You can see it's not as deep in just in the side by side with the uh, with the R6. Uh, these are 2022 prices uh, with the Bimini, with the cover, with the tonneau cover, uh, with the seagrass flooring, with the battery chargers and the battery switch, which I think are, are options that everybody would probably want to get. Um, you're at 96000 um, plus you need to add freight and dealer prep is not included. I don't know what freight is from Kansas, but probably 2000 or so is a, a reasonable number to use for freight. Dealer prep is going to be whatever they charge. Uh, the R6 you get with the similar options to just over 148000 Again, add freight, add prep uh, to that, and, um, and you've got MSRP price. Uh, so whatever the dealer's discount is going to be from there. So that's Cobalt. If you've owned a Cobalt, I would love to hear um, your comments. I'm going to assume most of them are great experiences. Um, let me know how you think it compares. If you've owned a Cobalt and other boats, let me know what year Cobalt you own, what year other boats that you've owned, and give us your real-life experience. Um, I've been fortunate that I've been boating on that R5 for, for two or three years now, and I've got a good amount of experience with it using the boat, which is, is really the best way to tell. Um, so leave that comment. If you like these, um, review videos, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment on that. If you're a boat owner, you want to get total control of your boat, check out that best boat captain on the water. If you're interested in buying a boat, the U.S. Boat Expo, you can get a free seven-day pass. It's a fantastic program. Subscribe to the channel. We're always putting out new stuff, and uh, YouTube's recommended some videos for you as well. Thanks a lot. Remember, life truly is better on a boat.